in case you want to have the, a copy of that, we always have, uh, um, we always record this. And so just to have a, uh, a backup for, uh, for the future. So, okay, now we are going to go then to the, the topic. Uh, the question, and I sent it this afternoon, which I, I normally don't do. This time I, I, I kind of tease to you by sending this. The, the, uh, the question that we have to deal with tonight is um, how do we understand, how do we understand uh, when, when we find a text that seems to be saying or at least suggesting that God teaches or that God tells his people to lie, to lie. And so for that, I want to take you to 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, I want you to see that, that controversial text that is found in there in specifically in verse 2. So 1 Samuel chapter 16 in verse 2. And in that verse, the context of this, as you may remember, is that Saul has been destituted, divinely destituted from uh, his position as the king of, uh, of God's people. And uh, because of his rebellion, because of his wickedness, he was destituted by God. And uh, at this moment, God is sending his prophet Samuel to anoint a different king for his people uh, by the name of David. And you'll, you'll remember the, the story for sure. And, uh, and, so, and so when this happens, when this happens, Samuel is to go back to this territory when Saul was still the king to anoint uh, King David or anoint David, who was, the who was to be the next king. And of course, uh, when a new king came into, into the, uh, on the throne, it was either because the, the new king um, conquered the nation or simply the old, the, the king or the uh, former king died. And so uh, there was no other explanation. So the fact that Samuel is coming to this territory to anoint David would definitely put a lot of pressure on his neck um, had he said that he was coming to anoint the next king. And so that is, that is the, uh, the context for what we are going to read in verse 2. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 2, which is the controversial passage for today, it says, but Samuel said, how can I go? This is Samuel talking to God, and he asked this question to the Lord. Uh, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me, which was a, a reality and a, and a fact. It, it was going to happen. And so this is God's reaction to this uh, statement given by, by, by uh, Samuel, the prophet. And, lo and the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, here is where the controversy is, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And here is, the, here is where the controversy um, uh, lays in, in is that it seems to be um, saying, if we just read superficially, that God is telling the prophet to, to lie, to lie. So God is sending the prophet to anoint David. But when Samuel says, if I said that, that I'm going to do that, Saul is going to kill me. God says to him, Tell him or tell them that I have that you have come to this territory to sacrifice to the Lord. Is this a lie? Is God telling Sam, uh, prophet the pro prophet Samuel to lie? This is what we are going to see tonight. Okay, so uh, first of all, there is a reality that we see in our world today, a reality that we see also in the Bible. That reality talks about human. Uh, limitation, human limitation and sin. That's our context. That's where everything in the Bible after Genesis chapter 2, uh, specifically Genesis chapter 3, better said, um, plays on. And that is uh, the lim limitation of, of human beings and the sinful environment in which we, uh, we evolve, uh, we um, uh, uh, live. And so three things that are very 
easy to be noticed in the Bible is number one, deception is always present, always present when, when it comes to the wicked man. Deception, a good example of deception is Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 to 20, we find two characters, um, Abraham and Sarai. Abraham, this is the time when Abraham said to Sarai, uh, when they were coming to this territory, Sarai was beautiful. And Abraham, Abraham said to, to Sarai, lie and just say that you are not my wife, but my sister. Because if you say that you are my wife, they will kill me because you're beautiful. Right. And so uh, plainly, he's saying he's saying uh, he's bringing people to a deception. So they are they are going to give they are going to give or sell a lie as a truth. And so we find this in the Bible. Also, um, in Acts chapter five, and verses one through six, we find another example of these these um, uh, lie with with intention to deceive, which is what. Uh, we can define in the in the human context a lie with intention to deceive. So a lie told just that people will be deceived. In Acts chapter five verses one through six, we find these uh, these two spouses, uh, a husband and a wife, who sold the property. And at this time, uh, everyone was bringing to the prophet to the uh, apostles um, uh, all that they had, and they would be this this these. Uh, goods will be distributed among the needy, among the widows, among the people that were around the, the, uh, the apostles. But these people sold uh, a piece of land that was theirs, and then they came in, didn't give all as they committed to, but they gave part of it and lied about this. And so they, they lied with intention to deceive the, the uh, apostles. And uh, uh, Peter, I think it was, who said, you haven't, you haven't lied to men, but to God, when the light was given to, or was, uh, the deception was trying to, to be done to the Holy Spirit. And so lie with intention to deceive. And another kind of lie that we find in, in the Bible is, is also a good example of this is found in Exodus chapter one, verses 15 uh, through 23. So the first one was Genesis 12, 10 through 20. And the second one, Acts chapter five, verses one through six. And the last one, and this is pretty much um, a way to, um, to um, avoid or uh, evade uh, truth and with a pre, prevarication, with pre prevarication, actually. And so this, this we find, a good example of this we find in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And here we find the midwives lying to... Uh, Pharaoh, after Pharaoh said that uh, they were supposed to kill any, any uh, uh, child that was born male, right? This was right before Moses was born, which was the chosen one to uh, deliver God's people. And so right before that, uh, Pharaoh wanted to, to, um, um, to uh, control the growth of this nation. And, uh, and so he ordered, he commanded the midwives to kill every every uh, baby boy and uh, the midwives came back with a, a report which was actually a prevarication a prevarication a lie so this is the context in which in which the, that we find in the bible in the whole bible in in, uh, in, in on regards of deception lies or prevarication now with this in mind which is which is the, the human context that we find in the bible with this in mind we are to, again, go back to 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 and 2. How about 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 2? Because here we don't find people lying. Here, don't, here we don't find people uh, trying to deceive or trying to avoid truth. Here we find God telling somebody to do something that seems to be like deception, like lie, like prevarication. So is it, is it this that we have to understand here? Um, because, and this is what, again, the controversy, it, it, if, if God is telling Samuel uh, to lie, then how can the same God, uh, how can the same God expect truthfulness, right, if, from us if he teaches his prophet to lie? How can he expect us to be honest and truthful all the time if he himself 
seems to be saying something like this to the prophet, right? And, and so this, this God expecting us to, to be truthful all the time. A good example of that is found in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, by the way. Genesis 17 and verse 1. So the suggested solutions to, to this, uh, this dilemma is, uh, has been given by different people. And I want to just give you a couple of examples of what people say on how to solve this controversy. Some people say the prohibition against lying or deceiving is not an absolute standard in the Bible. That's what they say, right? How do we explain this? It's simply because lying or deceiving is not absolute. Like there are exceptions. There are times where you have to. And that's the, how they explain this. And other people, other, other group of people say that uh, lying to a liar is condemned, condoned, is condoned. So lying to a liar is, con- is condoned. It's okay to lie to a liar, in other words, right? So, uh, and that's why uh, a good example of this is found in Genesis chapter 30, when uh, Laban is, is, lie, is lied to, and they, and they use this as an example, and they said this is actually indirectly justified. It's indirectly justified because of who Laban was, okay? And so, that will also apply and justify what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verses 1 and 2. Because Saul was lost. He was a wicked king. And so is, is justified, is, is condoned to do this to a liar, in other words. So another solution presented for, by a different group is that they say higher norms transcend lower norms without abolishing them. In other words... Um, because you, you have a higher, a higher goal, it's okay to lie breaking a, 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 less, important, a less important rule. It's okay to do, it, to, do, to do this as long as you don't get rid of all that is good. Uh, that's the explanation that other people give to solve this dilemma. And the last one that I found is that uh, so another group says that divine deception is acceptable if it serves a higher end. So it's okay that God did it. God uh, bring this deception. It's okay because he had, he had a higher end in mind. And so the problem with these with this suggested solutions that uh, other groups present on this, on this problem, obvious problem, is that if we take either one of these, if we take one of them or, or all of them, we will be challenged by what the scriptures say on the character of God. Because the, the, the Bible clearly says, uh, clearly describes the character of God. And to take either one of these solutions that they suggest will be to go against that dis- descriptive and evident and obvious character that is described, the character of God that is described in the Bible. And so a good example of that is found in Numbers 23 and verse 19. Numbers 23 and verse 19 uh, is, is the verse that says that God is, is not a man, that he should lie. In other words, God doesn't lie, is what Numbers 23 and 19 says. Um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and 29, so a chapter before the one that we study now, also says that the glory of Israel, glory capital G, referring to God, right? The glory of Israel, Israel will not lie. That's what 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 29 says. So in reference of the character of God, God does not lie, right? Another good example of this, and you can uh, check this out later, is uh, first, uh, no, Psalms 89 and verse 35. Psalms 89 and verse 35. Another one is Titus 1, 2. Titus 1, 2. And another one is Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. So Psalm 89, 35, Titus 1, 2, and Hebrews 6 and verse 18. Those are good examples about, that, talks, that talk about the character of God and how, how uh, spotless and blatantness, and blatantness his character is. So no lie is found in him because he does not lie, right? So, so truthfulness characterizes the very nature of God's being. In, in his way of acting, basically, right? So, so the prohibition against lying is an absolute standard. It's an absolute standard because that's the example that we have 
from God, right? So this becomes an absolute standard of conduct uh, for us as well, for human beings as well, right? That's why uh, a good example of this that, that goes to the core of a human being, goes to the heart of a human being, is found in Psalm 51 and verse 6. Psalm 51 and verse 6. The Bible says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts, you will make me to know wisdom. So again, you see, you see, it has to do with the with the with the core parts of a human being to be honest and to always always say the truth, always say the truth. So consequently, then consequently, now that we we're talking about the integrity of God, uh, we can we can draw out a conclusion on on what we have seen so far. And that is that the, the interpretation of um, our text for tonight, First Samuel chapter sixteen, verses one and two, uh, simply simply requires to safeguard God's reputation as as a as a as a being of integrity and honesty, right? Expecting the same requirement from human beings. Why does he expect the same requirement? Because God doesn't lie. And so since he doesn't lie, he expects us to be the same, to do the same. And so it's very important for us to always, always, um, let me see. It's very important for us then, I was saying, to, to uh, speak well. when we come, when it comes to interpreting the passage, it's very important for us to, to keep in mind who we are talking about, Right. Because the accusation is not, is not against Samuel or Saul or David or Jesse or any of, the, of David's brother, brothers is on God. It's the accusation is against God. And so we need to safeguard God's reputation, his character, his integrity, his honesty when we examine the text. Okay? So um, one way to see this, and this is very, very interesting. This is one of the most, I don't know if you see it, but this is one of the most uh, critical and difficult passages to, to uh, explain and make sense uh, with because of the complexity uh, of the passage. And so one of the ways that has been found to explain what is actually taking place in 1 Samuel 16 verse 2 is that there is... The, the, the context, again, the context will help us to, to understand a little more of this passage. The context of, of our text shows the, the miserable state, as, as I explained in the beginning, into which Saul placed himself and his kingdom. So we have to consider what, what the bigger picture here when it comes to understanding this, this verse, number, verse, verse 2. And so in that context, in that context, I'm trying to, let's see, there is one, oh, there you go. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, so uh, God said to Samuel in this context, when he's going to uh, anoint David, when the king, uh, when King Saul was still alive, and he was not at this point, he was doing everything wrong and everything against God, and of course, he. Um, had the prophet open his mouth and said what he came to do, uh, Saul would not have hesitated to take the prophet's, the prophet's life away. And so, uh, so the fear that uh, the prophet was feeling at this moment is justified in a sense, right? It's justified. But in that context, uh, with that information, God said to Samuel, don't worry. He said to Samuel, in other words, don't worry too much. Don't worry too much because, and this is why, and we will see the different, way, the different reasons why God uh, might be suggesting why not to, uh, to, to, to the prophet not to get worried. And one of those is that uh, priest at this time, and that's what Samuel, Samuel was. He was a prophet. He was a priest at this point. And so uh, priest did go from place to place offering sacrifices. So it was, it was common to receive daily different priests coming to, to offer sacrifices in different places. And those sacrifices were normally followed by a special feast uh, at which 
the elders of the place where these uh, sacrifice and this feast was offered, they were invited to be honored guests. And at this point, of course, um, Jesse's sons were these elders, these, these leaders. So the fact that he invited these uh, Jesse's uh, sons uh, was just part of, uh, of the ritual that the, the priest was supposed to uh, lead out or conduct, which was, again, going from place to place, offering sacrifices, and also having a feast after uh, where the elders were part of. And so nothing out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the, the normal here in, in, in what's taking place in this, in this passage. Now, another point that we have to uh, keep in mind, in mind is that while, while sacrifice and the feast that follow were public events, they will do this, they will sacrifice, and they will do the feast publicly. The anointing, which is the other reason why Samuel was coming to this territory, the anointing happened disconnected from the sacrifice and feasting in, in a more uh, private setting. And good examples of these are the anointed of Saul and the anointed of David. Both of them were private, right? David was anointed in the presence of, of his brothers only, right? And Saul was anointed privately as well. So it was nothing out of the ordinary that, that, Sam, that Samuel will come for the, the, the sacrifice, have the feast, and then go and do the, the anointed privately. So there was nothing out of the ordinary no lie involved here when he was told by God to say, you are coming to sacrifice because indeed he was going there to sacrifice because that was his duty. That was his responsibility. So God's advice to, his, to this uh, frightened servant belongs then to a different moral category than deception, lying, or prevarication. Just different. We cannot call it a lie because God wasn't asking him to, to lie. And what he was told to say was not a lie, was not a lie. So what could have been then is that what, the way we can call this is actually um, a, a concealment, a concealment of an unrelated detail of his mission. So the prophet had a mission. He was sent by God. He was sent by God to this territory. He was to do his duty as a prophet, as a priest. He was to go, uh, give a, a, a place, um, an, as an offering to the Lord, um, conduct also a, a feast after. But the, the other part of the mission was uh, to anoint David. And so what he was actually doing at the end was, to con was concealing uh, an unrelated detail. Of, of his mission. So, and uh, we will go back to this concealed part because when we think about concealment, we think about hiding information, hiding the truth. And when we use the word hiding on this con in this context, it sounds like we are not saying the truth, lie. So, but let's, let's continue with the lessons that we can draw out of this to make sense with the concealment of this unrelated detail of his mission, that which is it's very important for us to understand what actually is, what actually is, uh, is taking place here in this text. So let's see the lessons that we can, we can learn from 1 Samuel chapter 16. So number one, God teaches Samuel how to be a careful custodian of, faith, of, of truth. And this is very important. And it also helps us to understand the passage in a better way. So again, God... God uh, teaches Samuel to, how to be a careful custodian of the truth. Custodian of the truth simply because he didn't need to say all that he came to do uh, to this territory. Right? And, and we have to understand in this same, in this same uh, setting that one thing is to speak the truth always. And a different total thing, totally thing, is, is to speak the truth at, at all times and in all places to all men in the same way. And I hope you see the difference. One thing is to say, uh, to speak the truth always, which is what we are required, what we are expected as Christians, as, as children of God, we are expected to say always the truth. But a different thing is to speak the truth 
at all times, in all places, to all men, and in the same way, right? So let me put it in, in, in simple words here. Samuel the prophet cannot speak in the same way to Saul as he does to David, right? The, the, there was information that, that Samuel needed to deliver to, the, to Saul that he didn't need to give to David. There was some information that he needed to give to David that he didn't need to give to, to Saul, right? Um, and an even more uh, uh, sim simple example that I can think of will be um, uh, our conversations that we have with our spouses at home, right? Or, or people that we, are, that we have a close relationship with, right? The fact that there are certain things that we tell people that are close to us, my brother, my sister, my, my dad, my mom, my, my wife, the fact that I say certain things to them uh, that they know, that I know that I can tell this to them, doesn't mean that I have to bring those same things to the church and tell it to everyone, right? So, so things you share with your spouse, your friend, your close friend, your close relative, and the things you share in church or in public are two different things. But, the, but because you're sharing one thing with your spouse and you're sharing other information with the public doesn't mean that you're lying to either one of them, right? So this is very important to keep in our minds when we try to understand what God requested from the prophet. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, God, and this, we can be emphatic on this, God does not teach Samuel to lie. Just because of the nature of God, he is not teaching Samuel to lie. Um, had Samuel been requested to disclose disclose all, in, all information, he would have said, uh, he uh, who would have said all the truth. If, Sa if, Saul, if Saul would have come to, um, to uh, Samuel and said, Samuel, what else did you come to do here? Did you come to annoy David? Samuel would have had to say all the truth and nothing but the truth at this moment, right? After all, Samuel, Samuel did offer a sacrifice. So he didn't lie. He did offer a sacrifice. After all, he did call the elders together for the feast. He didn't tell the other plan to go there because, because he, he has he done so, it will have produced, and this is very important, it will have produced only evil and no good in his case. Right? There are times when concealing the truth saves lives or saves evil or even saves more problems right than than start giving details and, and creating more problems than bringing solutions and so that's this is one of those cases so if if um samuel was the prophet sent by god to anoint david and samuel will say i came to anoint david and he was killed the greater mission the, the good of the mission, the preparation of, of the king that God has, has chosen for his nation would have not be accomplished. And so only evil would have come out of um, disclosing every detail of his mission, right? So uh, he was telling the truth, bottom line. He was telling the truth and not telling half truth. So there is a difference between concealing the truth in this context and telling half truth. Because you know the saying, right? Half, half truth is a complete lie. But that's, this is not the case here because there was a context that we need to respect and there was a character that we need to respect also and protect in the same way. So um, that's lesson number two. Lesson, lesson number three Lesson number three is in, in this context, in the context that that we find this con con concealment, concealment of, of truth is not lying, is not lying. And on some occasions, it may be even a duty, even a duty. Consider this, only what was true was presented to sin. And that's how, that's how we know that con the concealment of truth is not lying in this context, because Samuel did tell all, uh, did tell the truth to, to Saul or to his uh, uh, patrolman. So he actually said the truth. The truth. He didn't lie when 
he was saying that he was coming to sacrifice because he did he did offer a sacrifice. He didn't lie when he said that he was going to have a feast after the sacrifice, which was the custom because he did have the the uh, the feast after after the sacrifice. So he did tell the truth. Um, now, I think the best way to see uh, to understand this text is always um, under the light of our Savior, and and Jesus becomes in every single problem, situation, misunderstanding, controversy that we find in the, five, in the Bible, Jesus will always be the solution to solve the problem. And here, I want to bring Jesus to, to come to, to bring to a close our, our, our discussion here. I want to bring Jesus as, a, as an example to, to what we have seen in the, in the text. Um, so it's, it's very in instructive in this case, as always, to bring Jesus as an example here. Um, Jesus, on, on, one, on, on more than one occasion, he escaped from his enemies. And you can see that in John chapter 8 and verse 59. Another example of that is found in John chapter 12 and verse 36. So John 8, 30, 59 and John 12, 36. He will escape from his enemies. And, and more than once he refrained, he refrained from answering. He will not give any answer, right? Mark chapter 14 and verse 61 is a good example for that. Mark 14, 61. Mark 15 and verse 5 also. People will ask questions and he will not give answers. Simple. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 9 is another one. So Mark 14, 61. Mark 15, 5. And Luke 23 and verse 9 are good examples of Jesus refraining from answering to anyone. And, uh, and uh, the wise men the author of Ecclesiastes, uh, he will also say uh, something very important that applies to what we're studying tonight. And he says, there is a time to keep silent and a time to speak, right? And this is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 7. There is a time to keep silent and there is a time to speak. And, and one thing that is for sure that we need to also understand is that no one is obligated to give an answer to every question asked. Yet, Jesus was not deceptive uh, when he did this, either in a speech or, or in silence, right? And, and uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and, 20, and verse 22 corroborates this. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. He was, he was um, blameless. He was spotless. There was not error in Jesus. He never lied. He, he, never, he never lied to anyone. As a matter of fact, to, to his disciples, he, Jesus said once, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So, so I gave you, Jesus spoke the truth to his people. Yes. Did he give it all? No. Why? Because they will not be able to bear all the truth. So there, were, there, there, was, there is a concealment, a concealment of truth. In, in the life of Jesus. And by the way, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Is, is found in John chapter 16 and verse 12 for those who take, uh, who take notes. So John 6, 16, 12. Um, before I read the last verse that I have, uh, let, me, let me just bring, I, we normally don't, don't do this, but let me just bring this. I, I, I love this quote from Sister White. Uh, I can give you the, the place where this is found, but I don't have it right now. But she says something that, that I think settles the matter on whether we is accepted to lie or white lies are okay or things like that. She says, even life itself, just listen to the, the category with, with which she uh, uh, portrays this. Even life itself should not be purchased with the price uh, of falsehood, right? Even life itself should not be purchased with the price of falsehood. That I think that I think that settles. That settles. Even our own lives, we cannot do that. And this brings to my mind again Abraham and, and Sarai. Right? So here is the last verse. In describing those who have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, John the Revelator underscores that in their mouths, he says, in their mouths no lie was found, for they are spotless. They are spotless. And this is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 5. 
what does the Lord expect from his people? That we will be uh, in, uh, uh, honest and transparent. That truth, that truth will be always in our mouth, in our lips. That everything we say will be always, always the truth. And that is what the Lord wants for us. And that is what he has set an example for. All right. So this is the time, 15 minutes before our time together. I'd like to hear what you guys think about, about this text and uh, the, uh, the journey that uh, we just went through.